Hi Titans, I'm Chris Adler, and today on In Focus, we have one of our very own Cal State Fullerton professors, Dr. Shana Charles, to discuss women's reproductive rights. Dr. Charles teaches in the Department of Public Health and worked as Director of Health Insurance Studies with nine years as a Senior Research Associate at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, specializing in politi political issues surrounding healthcare reform at both the state and national levels Dr. Charles has dedicated her research to focusing on expansions of health insurance and its impact on access to care. Dr. Charles, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. And can you just give us a little bit of background on who Dr. Charles is and where you grew <laughs> up? Sure. So I, I'm a California girl. I grew up in San Diego, went to UCLA um, to get my degrees. And while I was there, I also worked there at the Center for Health Policy Research, as, I, as you said, um, and uh, I got my master's in public policy, bachelor's in political science, so that really started me in thinking about this world of politics, and then I ended up getting a PhD in health services, in really health policy, because I found out that that is where you can help millions and millions of people at once. Uh, when I was getting my degrees, it was the Children's Health Insurance Program, now it's uh, you know the Affordable Care Act, which people might know as Obamacare, um, I also do work with the California legislature uh, where we, um, as part of a team of other researchers, I analyze health insurance laws that are going through the mm -hmm. legislature so that they know the impact before they vote on it and they're thinking about it. So I really like to have this very applied focus in my work and make sure that what I do actually makes an impact in the real world with legislators, the public, students, anyone needing it, uh, using this work to be able to you know, improve lives for everybody. What do you feel has been the most rewarding aspect of working in public health, but at the university level? So, it, you know, I love being here at Cal State Fullerton because we have a, such a diverse student body and a student body that is made up of people who are not only many of them the first in their family to go to college. Right. We have the most we have the majority of our, our campus has that status but also people that are going to be leading California in the future. I mean, if you look at things like the current legislature, our current assembly member who represents our district went to Cal State Fullerton. Our city councilman went to Cal State Fullerton. The speaker of the California assembly went to Cal State Fullerton, right? And I mean, even in, in 2019, when Joe Biden was ramping up to his presidential campaign, he came to Cal State Fullerton. I mean, this campus really has such a, a major impact. And so I love being able to work with the students here who are going to go on in the rest of their lives and, and have that impact, but also uh, you know, the, the departments of public health here are very active, our Orange County Healthcare Agency, which um, people have really gotten to know over this last year or so. <laughs> um, you know, they, they're very active and interested in public health, and it's just been a, a real joy to be here. This is my seventh year here on campus. And it does seem that, you know, being growing up in California, like you did, I grew up in California as well, I've always had those liberties and those freedoms that California Democrats, um, you know, push for. And it well, it's really interesting that you say that because I'm in my mid 40s and you look much younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to guess that you're a little younger. When I was growing up, California was still a Republican state, mm -hmm. you know, so it actually changed quite a bit in just about the last 20 years. Yeah. I and mean, especially in San Diego, San Diego and Orange County were both the Republican strongholds. And San Diego has really transitioned over to being actually mostly Democratic, um, you know, in the past 10, 15 years. So there's been a movement in California and it's been great to see. But one of those things that does have bipartisan support here, and, and it's interesting because you don't get that nationally, right? Nationally is mm -hmm. different than California. Yeah. Public health gets bipartisan support here. You still get votes in our legislature that are unanimous on both parties when it comes to supporting things like health insurance expansion, supporting um, public health programs, you know, and that's good to see. So one thing we do have here that, that we don't have nationally is this really respect for public health research and data and science. And, and we saw that, you know, during the pandemic as well, where, you know, every press conference Gavin Newsom gives, he talks about, and that's our governor for people who don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, and every con press conference our governor gives, he talks about he's working with the data to make these decisions. And, and he'll point to the data and, and point to, you know, here are the, the numbers that are, are backing up what we're doing. I think that's what a lot of people, and you're right, there is bipartisan push on, you know, there's both sides, especially with abortion. There are a lot of people in California who are against abortion. And 
with seeing what Gavin Newsom talks about, he does talk about the data. He talks about preserving those rights for women. How now looking at the legislation going on in Texas, mm -hmm. what kind of reverberating effects do you think that that will have? Seeing as though now Miss Mississippi is following suit, the the kind of the other way around actually. I, I, so I, I would like to know. You, yeah. Okay, I'd like to know your thoughts so on that. So there's some concurrent things going on. Mississippi's law actually was passed before Texas's. They were passed last year. And that one um, halts abortion services after 15 weeks of gestation. And there seems to be some confusion out there. We have kids. We were talking before. Yep. Both of us know this. But for people who don't know this, because honestly, it was something I didn't even know until I got pregnant myself, that the second you find out you're pregnant, you are probably already at least five weeks along because they start mm -hmm. counting it from the date of your last period. That's right. So it's actually impossible to be two weeks pregnant, three weeks pregnant. That exactly. The, you mm -hmm. missed your first period, you're already five weeks. So saying six weeks is like, oh, they might not have even known because you don't even, some, some women don't even take a pregnancy test until yeah. eight weeks, until yeah. they've missed a whole period, 10 weeks. Yeah, so just wanted to clear that up. Um, so the Mississippi law is being challenged in the Supreme Court because it went through kind of what we would consider to be the normal process in this country of a red state passes a really draconian law that goes against Roe v. Wade's protections and against mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood versus Casey from the early 90s. And the court stays it, it stops that law, and then it gets fought until the Supreme Court. That's how it's happened this whole time. What's been weird about the Texas law, which was enacted very recently, it was just enacted just a few months mm -hmm. ago, is that the court didn't stop it from going into effect. Yeah. And that hasn't happened before. That has not happened since Roe v. Wade was decided. and. This is where we have the change in the Supreme Court making such a difference that the Republicans rammed through this last minute. People in this country had already started voting for president, but we're going to run through this nomination at the last second. Uh, it was so disheartening to see, honestly, the hypocrisy of doing that. Mm. Um, and, and as I, I like talking politics, so I could talk about that story later, you know, if we want to go deeper into it. But having that extra vote on the Supreme Court who refused to stay the law was a huge change, a huge change. And, and Texas's law is so draconian. And even the governor who signed it obviously didn't know what the heck he was doing because he, he thought, for some reason, he thought six weeks pregnant meant six weeks after you missed your first period, which is actually 10 weeks pregnant. Mm -hmm. So the people yeah. doing the legislating That's exactly don't the even point. know enough yeah. medically to know what the heck they're doing. So what are they doing getting involved when they when when a person like that is trying to make such an important decision on women's lives but he doesn't even know the basics and the simple about the timetable of pregnancy. Right. right. So there's I I think there's something to be said about that. It, it's what are they doing? Why, why what, <laughs> what is going doing? on? You know, so in public health there have been decades of research on what actually works to reduce the number of abortions and what actually works, what will actually bring that number down, if that's what you care about doing, are empowering women to have more reproductive contraceptive choices for free, right? Taking away that barrier to access to care and making sure that that is universal, you know, to every woman. That's how you actually reduce the number of abortions because when women have the choice and the freedom and the access to be able to get, let's say, birth control pills, over-the-counter contraceptions. And they don't have to go back every single month. Mm -hmm. that you can go and you pick up 12 months supply at once, like you can here in California, yeah. because of a law that was passed about five years ago. Um, when you can do that and you have your own choices, then women don't need to end up having an abortion because they've already made the choice about when they're going to be able to have children or not. That's how you actually do it if what you really care about is helping people. So what the Texas law is about, because Texas, by the way, has some of the worst health insurance rates. They don't give people health insurance that we get here in California. So like in California, we get Medicaid under the Affordable yeah. Care Act expansion, mm -hmm. right? And many, many students are on that um, as a single person who makes under the required level, you get free or, or very low cost health care, health insurance. And in Texas, they don't. So whereas we have about 8% of our population uninsured, they have about 20-something percent uninsured. That's big. So, it's so you're saying if you really care about the, the killing of these babies and you want to prevent the abortions. Which as is the, the phrase as they, they use, as, right? Which is, the, let's clarify, this is the yeah. phrase they're using, right. yes. And you want to prevent these abortions, then 
what about some health care reform then? Give right. these women access to birth control, well, which will and ultimately health, reproductive and, and reproductive health care. Right, you support Planned Parenthood. But they don't, don't support oppose. out right. there in so, Texas. It's much more rigid. Right. So what? Uh, right. So what ends up happening is this draconian. Well, we're going to say you just can't do this service, this reproductive health service, and we won't give you all the other things too. It's basically it ends up being a situation of forced pregnancy, where you are forced to have a pregnancy that you don't want to have. And by the United Nations Human Rights Abuse Charter, forced pregnancy is a human rights abuse. I mean, that's very clear, internationally known, been very clear since the 1960s yeah. when this yeah. was signed. Yeah. So, and, and if you think about it, like, think about if you heard that, you know, let's say, God forbid, but let's say the Taliban in Afghanistan were telling women that they had to have babies, that their husbands forcibly... Mm -hmm. You know, I hate to use the word rape because it's such a triggering word and, and I apologize for yes. using that. But that's what but happens. But it's true. But that's what's happening yeah. in Texas right now. And I hate to use that comparison because I think, you know, we don't want to use those comparisons unless they're accurate. We don't want to be overblown. This is not overblown. Yeah. This yeah. is the, the judge who actually did issue a stay last week on this law mm -hmm. and then was overturned by, a by just a couple court. of days. Ridiculous. Yeah. But the judge very clearly laid out in the, the few weeks that that Texas law has been in effect, there have been documented cases of rape victims, incest victims, who were not able to get abortion services and had to have these forced pregnancies, right? That's a yeah. human rights abuse. And it's, it's just really, you know, almost stomach churning you know, that this is happening in the United States today. It and really that's is. one of the controversial issues of the this new Texas abortion law is that it doesn't give the exception for rape or incest. And that is cruel. We talk about the cruelty, well, people talk about the cruelty of killing the babies, but what about the woman's right who was raped? Should she have to keep that baby? Yeah, and I think I want to also clarify the language that you're using is, is from people who call themselves pro-life but are really yes. not. Yes. And then the other issue is, is that legally, right, from Roe v. Wade and, and uh, the Casey versus Planned Parenthood decision in the 90s, legally, it is not a baby until it's viable, right? And so you have this demarcation, and it's a scientific demarcation. There yeah. is a, a, a place in a pregnancy where it transitions from being, this is a pregnancy that would be um, terminated to this is a baby that could live outside of its mother in a NICU, Right. And we're not even talking anywhere close to full term. We're talking 24 yeah. weeks, 23 weeks, right? That end of the second trimester. And that's the demarcation of when the fetus becomes a person and therefore then has its own human rights that can be protected. And also at that point, you know, things can still go wrong. This is the other issue we're talking about. So regardless of how conception happened, yeah. let's say you have a couple who is fully happy in their marriage, really wanted a baby, been trying, has a pregnancy, they could be told, God forbid, but this certainly happens, in week 12, week 15, even week 20 and beyond, this baby is not developing right. Yeah. We can tell from the sonograms, we can tell from you know all of our tests that something is really wrong. And, and that something can be as wrong as this baby doesn't have a brain. This baby spine is outside of their body. I mean, these horrible things happen. And in that yeah. situation, you know, it is heartbreaking for the parents who have now lost a child, but the human body doesn't spontaneously lose that child. No. If nothing, if, if the medical procedure that is called abortion, but really is medical care is not done, then the woman would have to carry a basically a dead baby until the, you know, birth happens in the ninth month for months and months. I mean, that yeah. again yeah. is a human rights abuse. And under the Texas law, that happens. Doctors are not allowed to provide that kind of medical care for those families. And it's, it's really um, horrendous. It's, and so it's really you're speaking horrendous. about like when we go in for those um, nuchal ultrasounds and we're looking for spina bifida and we're looking for major, major health defects that are ultimately going to affect that, that unborn child's life. If they do, if they are born, yeah. what kind of quality of life is that? So it's well, they might be, I mean, they're and, and, born and dead some, too. and, and there, and some born dead. Right. I so, mean, that's. Right. And yeah. so that's that's a big issue. I mean, I remember in my third trimester um, with my first child who was born at a weight where her even though she was full term, she was prenatal weight because just that was her yeah. development. And we had issues. Um, we had to count 
the hiccups, count the kicks, right? Mm -hmm. You have yep. to do that kick count. Mm -hmm. And they do that to determine that the baby's still alive. Yeah. And I remember it, that. It's horrible that mm -hmm. some women have a day where there's no kicks, where there's no no nothing, and then they determine, no, this this fetus is no longer yeah. you know, going to yeah. happen. And that's when you have to have that horrendous medical procedure that nobody wants to have, but it's medically necessary at that point. Yeah. And again, it would be outlawed under this Texas law, which is insane. So even even a baby that is going to be born, a stillborn, and, or has died in the womb, Texas law is saying that it's still not okay at yeah. that point. Yeah, that's considered to be an abortion that is outlawed. And this is a this is a, so many women are out went out in the marches. You were out in the marches from Washington D.C. all the way to, down to Alaska, to, <laughs> Alaska, <laughs> and right here in our in our town of Fullerton. Talk yeah. about those marches. What? Why were Absolutely. women out there? What so, were they saying? Yeah, that I, I'm glad you brought that up because that was really an empowering experience. Um, and you know, I moved back here to Fullerton in uh, 2015. I had lived here earlier and it was, it was pretty conservative in the early 2000s. Um, I remember seeing Pat Buchanan for president posters and, and feeling like I was the only Democrat around. <laughs> and I moved back up to Los Angeles and then came back down here for, to work here at Cal State Fullerton in 2015. And I still thought it was pretty conservative. Yeah. But then um, in 2017, I connected in, you know, after Donald Trump was elected, there was the Women's March movement um, and I connected in with them, and that was really empowering where you see all these tens of thousands of people in Orange yeah. County at multiple different locations. Orange County had multiple different marches, right? Not even yeah. just one. Um, it's like, oh, no, we're not alone. Here we are. And it turns out, actually, Orange County started voting blue since then, right? Voted for Hillary Clinton in yeah. 16, and since then has been voting blue in many ways. Um, so Orange County is at least purple, right? And when the, the Women's March has been going every single year, and in, except for 2020, well, I'm sorry, 2021, um, because of the, um, the COVID, but in 2020 actually was their, their latest one, because it's January. So January 2020, we were still all gathering. And I was out there still, you know, this is my fourth year yeah. there. Um, and I was out there at the Women's March, and I talked to some people who said, a lot of women in their 20s who said, this is my first Women's March. They hadn't even gone to the ones the years before, mm -hmm. and they were still getting interested, still going in 2020. And in 2021, the Women's March organization, you know, in response to the Texas law, in response to the fact that the Supreme Court didn't say it, which is huge, huge, huge that they huge. did not say you can't put this law into effect. And then another appeals court, right? So we're seeing this in real time. They organized nationwide, you know, through Facebook, through their networks, through email, through all those things, that these marches would happen on October 2nd. And in Fullerton, we expected about, so there were, I think it, they told me it was about 275 RSVPs, which usually means about 100 people will show up. Yeah. Actually, about 400 people showed up. It's amazing. Just in Fullerton. Yeah. And then there was another one in Santa Ana, a bigger one in Irvine. Another, yeah, there was Irvine, right? Mm -hmm. So Orange County had multiple locations. But we gathered at the, the courthouse, the federal yeah. courthouse in Fullerton, because it's a federal issue, right? It's not something, yes. even in California, that we have to say we're under attack, because we're not. But we're standing with our, our sisters and um, anyone who can get pregnant, which, you know, was a really important point to make, um, yeah. that you have trans men who can get pregnant, you have non-binary people who can get pregnant. So anyone who can get pregnant deserves to have the ability to choose their own reproductive health and, and do that. And I, I was able to speak at that rally um, and just make this point and, and make the point that what we really need to do is to let our elected leaders know that we care about it. Um, there is a bill in Congress right now called the Women's Health Protection Act that would enshrine the protections of Roe v. Wade into law that would outlaw things that some states are doing right now, that even less than what Texas is doing, right? Because Texas is way off the charts. But even some states have laws that say that you can establish if you are quote unquote pro-life, they call themselves that, I do not call them that. I really think they're anti-women's health care. When you, you can establish what you call a pregnancy center and then lie to women about their rights. Um, that's outlawed here in California. Other states are allowing it. The Women's Health uh, Protection Act would outlaw it nationwide. Wow. Being able to do that, right? Wow. So that has to be, that's, mm -hmm. it's kind of scary that that has to be put into federal law, but it does. Um, it has actually passed the House, but I will say, very disappointingly, that our Fullerton representative, um, Young Kim, uh, who she is... A woman, for people who don't know Young Kim, um, she is a, 
a local representative mm -hmm. here, um, worked for Ed Royce for many years, who was a Titan as well. And for many years, Ed Royce had a conference here on supporting women and empowering women. And he was a you know, more moderate member of Congress. Yeah. Young Kim voted against the Women's Health Protection Act. And wow. I was really disappointed to see that. Um, I'm I, I, did, I wasn't aware of that. I'm surprised. Yeah, wow. it, it was really, really disappointing because, I mean, she is representing a, a purple district and yeah. a district that includes Cal State Fullerton and includes um, all of us who want to protect women's reproductive rights. And she voted against to protect it for the rest of the country. Yeah, um, so that's that's surprising yeah. to me. Um, and hearing you hearing you speak about this, you use the term women's reproductive rights. There is a bigger picture here. This isn't about killing babies, as the pro-life uh, people are calling it. There's a bigger picture here. There's much more at stake and much more in danger. So if Roe v. Wade were to get overturned, what would that mean for you know, people? I'm really glad you brought that up because you're right. It, it is a bigger picture where Roe v. Wade established this right to privacy that included abortion, but also included things like LGBTQ rights to yeah. marry, mm -hmm. right? So the Roe v. Wade decision led directly to the Obergefell decision um, that established the nationwide right of, of uh, I, I should say, any couple um, yeah. who wanted to marry of any gender and any sexual orientation to marry. And so if that if Roe v. Wade gets overturned in its entirety, that could have repercussions for other things as well. And you're right, I, I, I do use the phrase women's reproductive rights, but I think you're absolutely correct that we're talking also about men's reproductive health, yes. right? Yep. I mean, men have the right um, to have make their own medical decisions and to uh, you know, have their control over their own bodies. Um, for example, and this is something, honestly, I would actually encourage people to do as I've seen it used effectively as a family planning thing, and I don't think men should be afraid of it, is that men, if you know that you are not in a place where you want to have children in your life, you can have that vasectomy. In fact, they even offer them Absolutely. over at the Student <laughs> Wellness Center. You can have that vasectomy and get it reversed later and That's very right. successfully That's have right. children Absolutely. with no issue when you're ready to do so. Um, That's a great point. And I really appreciate Absolutely. you bringing that up. I don't think, I think most women don't realize that, and, but definitely most men don't realize that. And it's, it's absolutely uh, an option for them. Yeah. I, I, and I think people in general need to be, you know, thinking proactively about their own situations in life. I mean, certainly we know sexual health is very important, um, not just for, you know, STD prevention and health care, yeah. but also thinking about, you know, how, uh, family planning works in your current life situation and current relationships. And just thinking about that and, and being conscious about it is a way of taking control over your own life and your own destiny in a way that um, is, is empowering for anybody. I think two key elements to this are so important, and it's education and access to health care. Absolutely. And, we give, we, and if Texas were to give their citizens access to, to health care, then there would be a, an exponential re reduction in those abortions that, that are happening. Right. If they don't have access, what, what are they left to do? Exactly. So you know, let's look at California as the alternative example. Here in California, we you know, have implemented the Affordable yeah. Care Act, so we've expanded health insurance already, right? So our health insurance rates are very high, which means that for everyone who's insured, you get free, you know, free birth control, um, over-the-counter birth control, contraceptive care, all of those things yeah. are for free. We've also enshrined in the law that those things are offered for free in the state health systems, which includes the Cal State System Student Wellness Center. So our own Student Wellness Center on campus, and again, we have 40,000 students here, most of whom are in reproductive yeah. health age, right? <laughs> Maybe not everybody. I've taught yes. a few people in their late 50s, but uh, pretty much everybody. Um, the Student Wellness Center offers not only free contraception, over-the-counter contraception, um, but also, as we, we mentioned, the vasectomy services, pregnancy tests, morning after pills, all those things are offered through the Student Wellness Center. And right before the pandemic hit, in January of 2020, they signed into, Governor Newsom signed into law a new law that will make the medication abortion services available on campuses through the Student Wellness Center oh, wow. um, by January 2023. So they're working on implementing that right now, but it's not that far off, right? No. I mean, January 2023, um, and the medication abortion is good for up to 10 weeks. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that makes it so you don't have to have a surgical procedure later. It's, yeah. it's yeah. you know, makes it easier to do. So 
you know, we're expanding healthcare. We're working on expanding access, and we see our numbers of abortions going down. Well, it makes because, sense. I mean, it, yeah. it makes sense, right? And I have to ask you this: uh, for the people who are claiming or who say that they're pro-life, are late-term abortions, in your opinion, are those cruel? So, the, they mean the bans on late-term abortions, or are the yeah. abortions themselves The cruel? abortions themselves. So, I really feel like, you know, the, the, the example that I brought up earlier is the only reason why people would choose to have one of those third trimester abortions. When you look at when third trimester abortions are not outlawed, as they are in many states, but like in California and other states, they aren't outlawed, they are medical decisions. Yeah. People only do that in the most extreme circumstances when the life of the mother depends on it. It's not something, yeah. it, because at that yeah. point, you know, even if, I mean, these are people that have been pregnant for all this time, you know, they've picked out a name already, they're, uh, you know, they're already planning on having this child, and then they get this horrendous medical news. Because, you know, even if you get the medical news, let's say that the mother has a condition and that the baby needs to be born early to help the mother, like in a situation yeah, of, let's say, yeah. twins. That happens quite often. If you have twins, the babies are born by cesarean section, usually around 30 weeks. You know, doctors know that's you can do that. They know they can do that. That would not be a late term abortion. That's you have an early right. C-section and then the kids go yes. into the NICU until they're able to function on their own. The only reason why you would actually do something that would be considered to be a third trimester abortion would be this is a fetus that is already, as we mentioned, for yeah. all those horrible yeah. situations, not viable for whatever reason. And sometimes those reasons are as severe as this child doesn't have a brain. This child's spine is outside of their body. I mean, it's or this child's already dead and you yeah. have to have this, quote unquote, abortion procedure just to evacuate the uterus. You know, I mean, in those those situations. So I would say yeah. preventing that from happening is cruel. You yeah. know, if you ban that and you say, doctors, you're not allowed to do that and you're going to make this woman now have a stillborn baby two months from now while she knows she's carrying around a dead baby for two months, I can't even imagine the mental torture yeah. that that would be. Thinking about my own last two months of pregnancy. Um, what that would have been like. Just with a complicated pregnancy. What would it mm. have been like if I had known for those two months? I'm like tearing up thinking about I'm it. sorry, yeah. That... It's the fetus was, was, had passed away, but I was still going to have to go through this. You know, I couldn't have imagined yeah, right. that it would have been, it would have been so much more devastating so think, already on top of I think it happening. comes back to the idea that any forced pregnancy is a human rights abuse. Yeah. And you know, it, that's true for so many things in life, right? I mean, you think about the difference between consensual loving relationships and domestic violence, you know, slash rape, right? It, it might be the same physical action that you're doing, and it's so different in terms of a situation. Anything forced is a human rights abuse. So what do you say to those who say somebody who's in a consensual loving relationship, they weren't using birth control, they get pregnant, and they wait three, four months, and then they finally make the decision the baby has the heartbeat at that point. In what do you say to those who say that that woman is cruel for, for terminating the pregnancy at that point? Well, so when you think about, you know, we could talk about weeks because it's 40 weeks for a pregnancy and you said three months. So that's 12 weeks along. That's yeah. the end of the first trimester. Um, you know, and honestly, most, they call them spontaneous abortions, which means your body just has a miscarriage happens yes. in that time frame too. I mean, that is a reasonable time frame. At that point, we're still talking about a fetus. The baby is not a baby yet. It's, it's a fetus. And if that woman decides that her situation is such that this is not possible financially, emotionally, for whatever reason, then it's her right to do so at that point. This is not, you know, to me, that's that's not an issue, regardless of if but you're in a consensual loving relationship or not. Regardless, the woman should be able to make that decision for herself, make that decision whether or not it's the right time for her to bring that child into the world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's again, a woman's own right to be able yeah. to determine um, her reproductive future and all of these things. And, you know, it, it isn't a viable child yet, right? We're not talking about 30 weeks along, obviously, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, so this is a, there, there is a continuum. And I think it's, it's important to remember that women have these rights. And if anyone recoils at that, you got to ask yourself, what does that mean about what you think about women's rights? Yeah. And, there is, yeah. there are, you know, many men who, when I have this conversation with them, will say, well, what about the man's right to be able to say that he wants it? 
And there is an aspect of, you know, pre-planning on that because there, there, this is a domain that is not yours. Your right ends at someone else's body. Yeah. You know, you also don't have the right to have sex with anyone anytime you want That's to right. either. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, so if, if you know as a man that this is, you would not want a woman that you were with to end up having an abortion, then you need to think earlier about, well, maybe I should get that vasectomy. Maybe I should <laughs> take get, some uh, you know, precautions. Make before. sure those preventive measures. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and in California, another thing that we're doing to um, give women the right over their own body, I mean, there's this horrible thing called stealthing. Um, yes. which was just outlawed in California. Yep. I want to let your viewers know that was just made illegal and you can be prosecuted now for doing that where you surreptitiously remove the condom so the woman doesn't know and then she gets pregnant. You, which that even act, she doesn't get yes. pregnant, by the way. You, you surreptitiously remove the condom. It's a criminal act You have committed a now. criminal act now, yeah. yes. Thank you for pointing that out. I think that, that we saw that that just passed and I think that's an excellent law that's put into place because... I've seen, I've seen in my life, I've seen, I've heard of stories where men did that. And not just pregnancy, but we're talking about disease on top yeah, of it. Yeah. So. Well, and just you've broken the trust of the consensual act. Not to mention the moral yeah. interpretude that that shows. So. Yeah. Um, so bottom line, we are talking about a bigger picture. We're talking about robbing women of their personal rights, their human rights, constitutional rights. There's a greater a bigger picture going on and to be seen here. And if, if Roe v. Wade gets overturned, could we potentially see other states following this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, so 11 states already have laws on their books that say if Lo, Roe v. Wade is overturned, then we immediately outlaw abortion. Done. It just immediately goes into effect. Right away. It, it's, it's scary to me. And, you know, I think... So we talked a little bit off camera before about how California, or we talked a little bit about California has changed over time. That, that was earlier, yes. right. So thinking about the rest of the country, I would not be surprised if this were the point where the rest of the country changes over time to you know, put the Republicans out of power. So here in California, the Republican Party, because of um, changes not only in reproductive issues, but also in things like Prop 187, which was targeting uh, Lat Latinx people and, uh, you know, issues about really targeting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people's human rights in that way. Um, the Republican Party is actually third, a third party status, not even a second party anymore. The Democrats' registration is about 50%. No party preference mm. is bigger than the Republican Party in California don't at this not point. Point that out, yeah, yeah. So I mean, they, they really made themselves into lower, lower status, and we might be on the verge of seeing that nationwide, where the Republican Party has gone so extreme. Yeah, and you know, we see what that's done. We see what that's done with the judiciary. We see what that's done with the laws that they will enact with the legislatures and the governors. That I really feel like we might be on the verge of seeing the Democrats, you know, really sweep. In California, the Democrats are a super majority in the legislature, meaning mm -hmm. they have three-fourths of the legislature, um, two-thirds to three-fourths of the legislature. And it's, uh, you know, if we see that nationwide, we might get to a point where, you know, Republicans really end up kind of disappearing as a party and the Democratic Party becomes, mm -hmm. you know, kind of really the dominant force and maybe even splits into two. But... We're definitely in this time of transition because there's no question that what they're pushing is so extreme that it's, I've heard it being termed by some people as they want to roll back the 20th century, right? Yeah. Fighting yeah. against vaccines, <laughs> which were the way that we have increased life expectancy it's in this country by 30 yes. plus years, yeah. right? Fighting against vaccines, which have protected us throughout the entire 20th century, fighting against civil rights, which have protected us, fighting against women's rights, fighting against all these things that we already fought for and created you know, throughout the entire 20th century, I don't think this country wants to roll all that back. Well, I, I'm curious to know what your opinion is on that, because I've noticed Republicans will say we're pro-life, we're pro-life, but you're not pro-women's choice. What about the life of the woman who is alive and here? Yeah, or absolutely. what about the children and, and the, the, the migrants who are, are, are seeking refuge and coming here. What about those lives? You're pro-life, but the lives that are here, it seems that you're not really pro-life. Well, I think maybe we could just stop using that term then. I mean, yeah. you know, so some, if it? someone calls themselves one thing and you don't 
agree with it necessarily. Like if a white supremacist calls themselves a patriot, I'm not going to call them a patriot. Exactly. I'm going to call them a white supremacist. That's right. Because you know? that's, that's right. what they yeah. are. So, I mean, I, that's why I say I, I don't use the term pro-life. I use anti-women's health. I mean, so what do you think it comes health. down to? What, is it, what does it come down to these radicals that are trying to overturn years and years and years of legislation that have actually helped Americans? What does it come down to? What, why are they doing this? Well, you know, so you said legislation there, but I think it's, I, I want to point out, it's actually a lot of court decisions because we couldn't get the legislation. We need the legislation. Yes. And again, we've got that bill in Congress right now that's passed the House and if it can pass the Senate, mm -hmm. Joe Biden will definitely sign it. And then it would be legislation, and that would be really helpful, right? So um, we need to, to work on that. <laughs> that would be great. Yes. Um, but why? You know, it's hard for me to understand because uh, I've been in public health for about 20 years now. And when I work in California, it is bipartisan. Yeah. You know, and I mean, in the mid 2000s, I was working with Governor Schwarzenegger's office about expanding health insurance in California. And we actually would have had the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare here earlier um, than that nationwide, except it, it ended up being killed in the legislature by people on the left mm -hmm. who thought it didn't go far enough. Oh, yeah. I mean, so California has such a different dynamic. So it's a little hard for me to understand because I will say yeah. in California, I am able to work with people on, on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, we, we have agreement yeah. that what we want to do is protect human rights. And, and that's helpful. Uh, nationwide, that doesn't seem to be the case. And I do feel sometimes like it's a little bit like beating our heads against a wall. Yeah. But I think what's going to need to happen is really just you got to change the people that are there. When you look at some of the people in the Senate, they have been there for 30, 40 years Right. We time. need to change some <laughs> yeah. of those people. Right. We need new blood. Um, yeah. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about California because we've had that same commitment. But I mean, talking about some of those you know, Republican state senators, yeah. um, hopefully will get changed over. Um, and, and in the House, we need to have a greater majority in the House so that, you know, if we end up having um, a president who vetoes, we might be able to overturn it. You know, I That's mean, right. So mm -hmm. and. and we just need to make sure that we really care about elected officials and who's actually holding those offices of power, that they're people that are going to protect the things that we care about. We can't assume that they will. No. We can't assume it. You have to ask them straight out, what are your positions on this? And hold them to that. Hold them to it. I mean, clear. like you said, you know, we're surprised that young Kim voted against it, right? Yeah. And, and I am too. Yeah. But, you know, that's something we could have asked her before electing her. That's a great point. And now we can hold her accountable next fall. She's up for election in that's November. Right. right? And so if, get if out this there, is what people. You, <laughs> if this is what you care about, then don't vote for somebody yeah. that's going, you know, even though she's female and, you know, she talks about promoting women, it turns out when she votes, she votes against women's, yeah. the Women's Health Protection Act. And so hold her accountable for that. Don't vote for her again. You know, I mean... Th that's the way we have to do it is over the next few cycles, really care about who you're voting for. This is an issue that's important to you. Make sure Absolutely. the people you're voting for will fight for it too. Yeah. Getting out there, getting active and getting involved in it if you truly care about it. Yeah. Because that's the, that is the one way as Americans we have control over it. Well, that's the point. Politics is supposed to be where yeah. we make our viewpoints known. And we're at this point right now where politics has been kind of hijacked by a minority extremist group. And in part because the electorate hasn't paid as much attention. Yeah, yeah. And you need to pay attention to local races, too. Local races are really important. Yeah, You know, you've absolutely. got your city council people. You've got your, your county boards of supervisors, right? We found out during this pandemic time just how much power those people have. And if you care about things like we want to make sure that we get vaccine clinics out there and we want to make sure that we get mask mandates if they're needed at certain points or, or people that are going to care about public health, then make sure the elected officials you vote for are the ones who care about public health. Yes. Well, Dr. Charles, it has been so refreshing and such an honor having you here with us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I could spend hours talking to you, and it's been so informative. Mm -hmm. And we really appreciate you going out and fighting for women's rights. As a woman, I have to say thank you for doing that. Well, it's just um, part of caring about access yeah. to health care, right? I mean, that's the point. And human rights. And, Absolutely. And so, so thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. And women have been fighting for their reproductive rights for decades. And with this being such a controversial topic, it's important for us to talk about how it affects both sides. It's, cer it's certainly not an easy discussion to have. So we want to thank Dr. Shana Charles again for her thoughts 
and her expertise for sharing that with us. I hope at the very least this gives you all something to consider as we watch the courts make these life-changing decisions for women in our nation. Thank you for being here with us today on In Focus. I'm Chris Adler.